than human effort at keeping rules. So that was the, the, the thing that I wanted you to see from that. Um, and we can struggle with how we're going to apply that in our whole lives. I want to get to the next section, uh, which is the third C. First C, consider context. Second C, uh, comprehend their culture. And then the third C is comparing common scripture. So let's talk about this. Now, I want to give you an example of what I'm talking about where one verse seems to say something very specific, yet when compared with other verses, there is a bigger picture or there are qualifications or there are no qualifications, whatever it might be. So I'm going to deal with something and I'm I, I, I'm, I'm deliberately dealing with something that has some controversy about it, uh, so this just won't be dull or dry. And I do not in any way mean uh, to just be contradictory to what you or your local church may believe, uh, just to be contradictory. And in fact, um, although I hope that you end up with what I think is the truth about this topic, uh, that's not really the purpose of this today. The purpose of this today is to use this as an important example. So here's the question. Are generational curses real? Now, by generational curses, uh, there, uh, this is what I mean. There's a, a, a pretty popular belief among a lot of charismatics that when a believer struggles with a particularly difficult sin, that it's probably caused by sins in earlier generations, sins in the father or mother, sins in the grandfather or grandmother, sins in the great, great grandfather or grandmother. And they will point to things like Isaac, uh, Jacob was afraid, or uh, uh, Abraham was afraid, and so he left Egypt. Well, his son Isaac got afraid and left Egypt. Um, he said that this wasn't my wife. Uh, in regards to Sarah to save his own neck. Isaac did something uh, almost identical to it. So we say, aha, you see the sins of the fathers are being visited on the sons. Now, what this requires is, uh, according to some teaching, is that we have to do, uh, like uh, for a DNA search for our relatives, uh, we have to research history in our family. We have to go to our parents and say, uh, mom, dad, uh, was great grandpa a pedophile, um, or you know, did he have a uh, an anger problem, or 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 whatever? So here's my question: Is this biblical? Is this taught in the scripture? Well, frankly, it depends on how much you read. For example, now this is where uh, this is typically found. Look at Exodus 34. Now I want you to read this for yourself. Uh, I've got a lot of ground to cover, like always. I'm trying to give you as much information, and the videos are always available for you to go back to. So if, if you're serious uh, about this course and you're paying money and spending time, so I sure hope that you are really serious, uh, those videos are, are still up, and you can go back to them. You can stop them anywhere you want, add to your notes. So ex Exodus 34 uh, reading verses 6 and 7. Now, the context here is Moses has gone up on the mountain and God has given him the Ten Commandments, all right? And Moses is telling us about the story and he is telling us about what God said when God introduced himself, described himself. So here we go. Uh, by the way, double check, but I think this is the second, yeah, this is the second set, I believe, of tablets. You can, uh, because Moses broke the first set. Uh, you can double check me on that. Exodus 34, verses 6 and 7, uh, the NIV. And he, God, passed in front of Moses proclaiming. Now, this is God speaking, Moses recording it for us later. The Lord, or Yahweh, the Lord, Yahweh, the compassionate and gracious God, slow to anger, abounding in love and faithfulness, maintaining love to thousands or thousands of generations, depending on your translation, and forgiving wickedness, rebellion, and sin. Yet, now so far this is all very positive and very wonderful about God. Yet, or but, he does not leave the guilty unpunished. Now here's the key phrase. He punishes the children and their children for the sin of the parents to the third and fourth generation. Now, if we stop right here, 
um, the last portion of this verse certainly says he punishes the children and their children, that's two generations, for the sins, or because of the, the punishment is coming because of the sins of, of their parents to the third and fourth generations, of their grandparents, of their great-grandparents, of their great-great-grandparents. Well, um, if, if some would say, well, if you're going to get deliverance from that, then you've got to figure out in the history of your family who struggled with this kind of a sin, clearly never repented of it, and now the effects of that and the punishment for that has drifted down to you. So you have to repent of what great-great-grandpa did or great-great-grandma did or didn't do because that is spiritually affecting you now based on what this says right here, all right? Uh, this generational curse that goes from one generation to the third generation, the fourth generation, and following. So now the question is, uh, is that really what this says? Huh? Is that really what this says? Well, again, we have to ask good questions. So let's start right there. Let's start in the middle of verse 7. Yet he does not leave the guilty unpunished. All right, now here's a question. Who are the guilty? In this passage, who are the guilty? Now think about that for a minute. Who are the guilty that God is referring to? Well, context. Back up in the previous verse. Now here's the description of God. Compassionate, gracious, slow to anger, abounding in love and faithfulness, maintaining love to thousands. Now listen to these words. And forgiving wickedness, rebellion, and sin. God's nature, he says, is I am always willing to forgive. So the question then is, okay, then who are the guilty in the next line? Yet he does not leave the guilty unpunished. Then who are the guilty? Well, the ones who have refused God's forgiveness from wickedness, rebellion, and sin. Those are the guilty to whom the sins of the fathers, grandfathers, grandmothers, all that sort of thing. Okay, now stop right there. Is that you? Is that me? No. We've received the ultimate once-for-all sacrifice in Jesus. So we're not part of the guilty there. But it even becomes more important when we compare this passage with where it was originally spoken the first time God said it. Yeah, so we're going to compare a common scripture, all right? Go back to Exodus 20, because this is the first time Moses goes up on the mountain, God appears to him, gives him the first tablet of Ten Commandments, and then Moses comes back down. While he's on the mountain, the first time, the first time, Exodus 20, beginning in, four, in verse 4 through 6. All right, now let's listen to these and compare the first time, because what we just read in Exodus 34, I want to suggest to you, is a bit of a condensed version now you say, well, uh, Mark, how do you know that? Because we're going to compare these situations here. First time Moses goes up on the mountain, uh, verse 4, Exodus 20, verse 4. You shall not make for yourself an idol in the form of anything in heaven above or on the earth beneath or in the waters below. An idol, something to worship other than me. You shall not bow down to them to worship or worship them. For I, the Lord your God, am a jealous God. Now listen to these next words. Punishing, punishing the children for the sin of the fathers to the third and fourth generations. And the first time God told Moses this, he added this, of those who hate me. Suddenly, when we compare these two, there is an added aspect. Now, can there be some kind of generational curses on people? Uh I don't know. I don't know how all that works out. That's, that's above my pay grade. However, I do know this, that if they do work, they can only work in the lives of those who hate me. Uh, that's not you. That's not me. But he goes on and says, but showing love to a thousand generations of those who love me. So there's a definite distinction between those who hate me and those who love me. So if you are a hater of God, 
you may still be manipulated or influenced by things that have been done in your genetic bloodline. I, I, I honestly don't have an answer. I know that environment, environment will produce those kinds of bad behaviors. And yet the truth is, we know all kinds of stories of people who had absolutely terrible alcoholic parents. One child grows up and becomes an alcoholic. You say, well, it's because of his environment. Maybe. And yet, at the same time, another child growing up in the exact same environment, along with the child who turned out to be an alcoholic, they grow up and decide they're going to never, ever drink alcohol because they saw the damage that it does. Abusing it does. So how do we figure all that out? Well, the truth is we really don't. But the reality is that when we add and compare very common scripture, since this is talking about the first time God describes himself, we find the very important uh, addition of, of those who hate me. Now, this goes on in Israel's history. What they do, what they do is they take this idea that I'm being punished, I'm sinning, it's not really my fault, it's my great-great-grandparents' fault because they rebelled against the Lord. Now I'm being punished for it or I'm, I'm caught up in this. It's not my fault. That's what happened in Israel about this. Now let me show you this. Exodus chapter 18. I'm sorry. I'm sorry. Ezekiel. Ezekiel chapter 18. And anywhere along here, Alex, that you need to pause this for people to find them. Uh, then that's fine. Ezekiel chapter 18. Now, you can read the entire chapter because the entire chapter is divided up where this is the only serious topic that's discussed, all right? Verse 1, uh, Ezekiel 18. The word of the Lord came to me. What, what do you people mean by quoting this proverb about the land of Israel? The fathers eat sour grapes and the children's teeth are set on edge. Now, what in the world does that mean? The fathers do something wrong, eat sour grapes, and the effects are, 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 are implemented in the children. The children are affected, all right? We could chalk that up to environment. Say, well, the children just do what they learn from their parents. However, if we keep on reading then we cannot use that as an excuse. It's simply not true. It's still individual choice. Verse 3, As surely as I live, declares the sovereign Lord, you will no longer quote this parable in Israel. That why not? Why not? Is it not true? No, they're using it as an excuse. My fathers, my grandfathers, my generations before me, did this, and now I can't help myself. It's their fault. Verse 4, for every living soul belongs to me, the Father, as well as the Son. Both are alike. The soul who sins is the one who will die. Now, there, you can go for 30 verses. Take just a moment and look down the rest of that chapter, and it goes back and forth. God says it in many different ways. And it's all summed up in this. If the father sins, but the child chooses not to do that sin, the child is not in any way accountable. If the father does right, but the child chooses to sin, the father is not held accountable. They were using this as an excuse. It had become a proverb. It was used so often. Not my fault. My great-grandpa ate sour grapes, and now I'm all messed up. The, my my great great grandfather behaved horribly toward God, and now I'm I'm bound up in the same thing. It's not my fault, and God uses the entire chapter, all thirty verses, to essentially say, "Stop it! Stop putting the blame on your ancestors or your progeny, the, the those that are following you in your children and grandchildren. It, 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 everyone is responsible." for the choices that they make. Now, I'm going to read the same thing in Jeremiah 31. Get Find Jeremiah 31. God sent Jeremiah, and one of the great introductions in Jeremiah, also in Ezekiel, by the way, is the coming of the new covenant. 
Now, normally we would read uh, Jeremiah 31, 31. The time is coming, declares the Lord, when I will make a new covenant with the house of Israel and with the house of Judah. And if you keep on reading, it gives definition to what the new covenant is going to be. However, if we back up to the introduction of the new covenant, we would back up to verse 29. Jeremiah 31, verse 29. In those days, now those words are going to be important in a minute, what days? In those days, people will no longer say, or they will no longer use this excuse, quote, the fathers have eaten sour grapes and the children's teeth are set on edge. Instead, everyone will die for his own sin. Whoever eats sour grapes, his own teeth will be set on, on edge. Keep reading. The time is coming, declares the Lord, when I will make a new covenant with the house of Israel. Now, this I, I find this awesome. You know me, uh, new covenant grace is, is the, the foundation stone for everything. But I love this. I, I love the fact that God is once again saying, stop blaming anybody else for your sin, your weakness, your failure. Take responsibility for for yourself. And then immediately he says, and in those days I am bringing a new covenant. Now it's interesting that the new covenant, uh, the New Testament tells us, depends on faith and it depends on humility. Humility here meaning stop pretending you're better than you are. Now I love the fact that God uh, through Jeremiah is saying You've been using this proverb, well, it's generational, it's not my fault, it's past generations whose fault it is, it's not my fault, and yet the new covenant depends on my willingness to say, it's me. I cannot, I am hopeless in changing myself to be good enough for you, God. Only you can do that. That admission that I'm not blaming past generations, I'm not blaming anybody else for my need for a savior, this is the entrance, to the, the entrance to the new covenant. This is how I can live in the new covenant. Now